So this month I've talked about some of the best swashbuckling movies ever. But what was the movie that started off this new trend of sword fighting adventure movies in the 30s? Well, you have this movie to thank for it. Captain Blood. So Captain Blood is a 1938 pirate movie that was directed by Michael Curtiz. Yes, the same Michael Curtiz that I gushed about last week. And it stars his favorite actors, Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland, Basil Rathbone. And in a lot of ways, this movie is a precursor to Robin Hood. This was not only Errol Flynn's first big leading role in a movie, but it was also the movie where Michael Curtiz perfected his style of filmmaking. This movie is directed and shot beautifully. The cinematography is amazing, the ship battles and the sword play is really good, and of course you have the shadows. Of all of Curtiz's pictures, this one has the best lighting. Everything is lit so well. The romantic scenes are lit softly, the action scenes are lit with harsh shadows, and whenever you're inside a castle or a fort or someone's house, the way he uses shadows to tell this story is so good, and if there's anything learned from this movie is that adding dramatic lighting and shadows ups the production value. Now this movie had a decent budget, but it was nowhere near as expensive as something like Robin Hood. They had to cut quite a few corners to make this movie work, and one of them was making this movie in black and white. Now I know there's a lot of people nowadays that just can't get sucked into movies because they're in black and white, and to an extent I understand that. There is another level of separation between the audience and the movie, but for me there are some movies that were shot in black and white that are so well done and well lit in black and white that it's honestly better than if it were in color. And Captain Blood is one of those movies. And this was the movie that proved to Warner Brothers that Michael Curtiz could handle a Robin Hood remake. But as much as this did for Curtiz's career, it did even more for Errol Flynn's career. Like I said, this was Errol Flynn's big break and it unfortunately got him typecast as this swashbuckling rogue for most of his career, but he does it so well. He has so much charm and charisma in this movie. And while he clearly doesn't have the acting experience that he has in his later movies, the bones of a typical Errol Flynn performance are there. And another important contribution that this film made historically was that this was the first swashbuckling movie after the silent era ended. But you can't talk about swashbuckling in the silent era without mentioning Douglas Fairbanks. Now a lot of people have made this comparison, but Errol Flynn truly is the perfect successor to what Fairbanks did in the 20s. And it's no coincidence that they played the same type of character, you know, like a pirate, and even the same exact character like Robin Hood. But regardless, Curtiz and Flynn do owe a lot of their success to the types of movies that Fairbanks pioneered in the 20s. But even so, these are not carbon copies. Like I said before, Michael Curtiz definitely puts his own flavor in, and so does Errol Flynn. These people work very well together, even though they kind of hated each other. Errol Flynn did not like Michael Curtiz, and that's because Curtiz and his style of directing often put the shot ahead of actor safety. And Errol Flynn, being the leading man and doing most of, if not all of the stunts himself, he was put in a lot of precarious situations. But luckily none of that resentment comes across on screen. Errol Flynn looks like he's having a grand old time as Peter Blood, and he probably was at this time. Again, this was their first movie together, so the, their whole strained relationship really didn't happen yet. But let's talk about the story of this movie, because that's where this really succeeds. And this is honestly where the Pirates of the Caribbean movies should have gone after the first one. So this is the story of Peter Blood, a doctor who has served time in the Navy, but has since put away his sword and has become a healer, a peacemaker. But because there's a revolt going on at this time and he treated one of the rebels, he gets sentenced and sold into slavery in Jamaica, along with all of the other rebels. And it's here in Jamaica where we spend a surprising amount of time. The first half of this movie isn't so much a pirate movie as it is a slave movie. It actually does shed some light on the horrors of slavery, which was pretty rare for 1935. And I honestly think if this movie were remade today, this is something that you could expand on and flesh out even more. And as luck would have it, Olivia de Havilland's character actually purchases him so that he wouldn't be sold into harsher conditions. But even so, Errol Flynn does not take this graciously. He just harbors up resentment against this woman for purchasing him. Which again is refreshing because you know that the two of them are gonna fall in love. You have the leading man and the leading lady. But starting out this movie with him hating her, and rightfully so, I mean she did by him. And that's not a great way to start a relationship. But this continues throughout the majority of the runtime, and it doesn't really resolve until the third act. 
But anyway, Blood makes the best of his situation. It actually does work up some respect and honor, even though he is a slave. And that's because he uses his understanding of anatomy and medical treatment to help people on the island. But you know he's not content to be on this island forever. But of course, him and the rebels create this plan to get off the island and escape. But then we get a timely interruption. Port Royal is attacked by the Spanish fleet, and this gives them an even greater opportunity to escape, and they do. And now we get to the part of the movie that is by far my favorite. This is where he officially becomes a pirate. And not just any pirate, Captain Blood is the best pirate put to film. I know people love Captain Jack Sparrow, but Captain Blood is just the best. He's the kind of pirate that every kid wanted to be. No kid wanted to be the pirate that pillaged and raped and burned down towns. At least no kids that I know of. We all want to be pirates that sailed the seven seas looking for adventure, fighting bad pirates, fighting against oppression and tyranny. That's what made pirates cool. And to the credit of the Disney Pirates of the Caribbeans, that is what that franchise started out as. And Curse of the Black Pearl is another fantastic pirate movie, but Captain Blood did it first. And the big thing that sets Captain Blood apart from any of the other pirates is that this movie goes pretty in-depth at explaining the articles of piracy that these people sail under. And it pretty much boils down to that whatever treasure that they acquire will be divided evenly as a wage to each member of the crew. And if you suffered any severe wounds like the loss of an arm or a leg, or implemented some tactic that made the victory swift, you would get some extra money as listed in the articles. But now let's talk about my favorite part in any of these swashbuckling movies, Basil Rathbone back at it again. And here he plays the French pirate Captain Levasseur, who looks Honestly, an awful lot like Captain Hook. I bet you that Disney's Peter Pan was inspired a lot by this movie. But Basil Rathbone in this movie cracks me up. I don't know if this is intended to be hilarious. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not. But he is just so French. Now, Basil Rathbone is an English actor and a good one. But his French accent is so over the top. It's somewhere in between Louis from The Little Mermaid and John Cleese from Monty Python's Holy Grail. It's such a fake, cartoonish French accent, but you do remember him. It has not been settled for me. Prize covered in blood. <laughs> Au revoir, mon chéri. Oh, it's just so funny. And if that accent wasn't over the top French enough, his big weakness is women. Because, you know, French people, they're always after the women. But it would be such a loss to have Basil Rathbone in your pirate movie and not have him draw his sword. Again, I can't iterate this enough. Basil Rathbone is one of, if not the, greatest swordsmen to ever grace the screen. This dude has so much legitimate skill. So of course him and Errol Flynn fight, and it's on this beautiful beach set. I don't remember what island it's supposed to be, but seeing the two of them fight on this beautiful Caribbean beach with rocks and palm trees, it is yet another memorable sword fight that Basil Rathbone has performed, and... Again, this was the first time Basil Rathbone and Errol Flynn ever crossed swords. And as for the fight itself, it's not as good as Robin Hood or even Zorro. And even some of Errol Flynn's later movies like Don Juan and the Seahawk. This sword fight isn't nearly as realistic. It's clear that the two of them aren't nearly as well trained in this movie as they would be in later movies. But either way, it is an exciting duel. And when they do pull away to a wide shot, which again they do sparingly because they're not nearly as skilled as they would be later, the staging and framing of it is really good. But aside from everything that I praise this movie for, and there is a lot to praise about it, what I think makes this movie endure so well and honestly makes the pace pacing seem like a breeze, is the use of the minor characters. The characters that barely get a name that really do leave an impression on you. For instance, there's this one pirate that's part of their band, and there's a moment right after they looted a ship where everyone's getting their shares, and this dude is sitting up in the cockpit blowing off his own toe to get just a little extra coin, which of course doesn't work because Captain Blood is no idiot, and he probably heard him howling in pain up on the sail. But there's also the governor of Port Royal who suffers from gout, and he's so hilarious because he cares more about the pain in his foot than he does about the suffering of the people and slaves in Jamaica, but all the while condemning them and telling them that they complain too much and that they should take a note from him who suffers in silence without complaining at all. He's a joy to watch. And he also brings really good comedic timing to this role. But also in Port Royal, you have the governor's doctors who are just a couple of unqualified crackpots and they have no interest in making the governor's foot better. They're just trying to save their own skins and keep keeping themselves in this high status, which Captain Blood, when he starts gaining status and repairs the governor's foot, they are 
out of a job, but they also bring a lot of energy to their performances. They're very skittish and paranoid all the time that someone's gonna figure out their scheme. And all these characters just serve to make the movie more lighthearted and enjoyable, while at the same time tackling some really serious issues about slavery and oppressive government. And that's about it for Captain Blood, the grandfather of the swashbuckling genre. And I can't stress this enough, so much of what we associate with the swashbuckling genre and the adventurer with a sword comes from Captain Blood. Now again, a lot of it did come from Douglas Fairbanks, but the way we know it today, it comes from Captain Blood. This was the movie that started it all. So now I leave it to you guys. What is your favorite swashbuckling adventure movie, old or new? Again, you could go as old as Douglas Fairbanks or as new as the Pirates of the Caribbean. Which one is your favorite? So comment that below. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And as always, I'm Colby. This is my nerdy talk. And I'll see you in the next video.